Um, and, and the other aspect is that, that I mean, it's, it's of course desirable to think about ways in which, you know, can we finance, you know, developing nations, um, build out of, of infrastructure with, with some mechanisms where with, you know, more of the money from content comes into to the, uh, the, the, the actual infrastructure. Um, but that, that has some issues too. So it's one of the, the, the problems is, you know, preventing future innovation. Now, um, you know, if someone has a, um, a, 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 a um, you know, service on, on the internet and, um, and if, 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 the, if there's a requirement somehow that, that the, the, uh, the content provider has to pay for that content to be delivered around, then that, that, that's a fairly significant burden on, on that small player who's only beginning. And, and it, it's, it's, it's difficult to imagine that any, any small player would actually sort of commit to providing content all over the place because they, don't, they can't necessarily predict how popular, you know, some, some particular content will be or how successful they, they will be. So it, it, will, it would have a chilling effect on future new things. You're not all obliged to speak if you don't. So I will. Um, the money issue is always a big one in all of these uh, discussions. Un underlying, never people don't say it, but I think it underlines it. Um, and I think the answer um, to a lot of these questions goes back to what you do at your national or regional regulatory regime. So if you have a local uh, regulatory model that stifles innovation, that doesn't allow for predictable investment, that overly regulates, that doesn't support the development of local ISPs, then you have problems with content coming into your country. How about the U.S.? You're talking about anywhere. Um, also, I mean, you, you know, the, the internet topography has changed, and maybe Sam should speak to it because OEC has done a lot of good work on this in terms of how the, the topography of the, the network used to look and how it's shifted and how it's changed and how traffic patterns and flows have changed as countries have changed. They have allowed for local IXPs. But even just comparing the U.S. and Europe, people keep throwing around the word net neutrality in both countries. It means something different. And both, maybe both Chris's sitting next to each other could actually explain that better. But in the, it gets back to how you access the network. And in the U.S., we don't have local loop unbundling requirements. They were thrown out in a court system because of the foundational ownership laws of the United States. Your problem in Europe is, local, is, is how your access network is regulated. That's not an international problem. That's a European problem. Turn into an international problem, do you because uh, instead of going to Europe to fix the problem, some people went to the ICU to fix the problem, which was a mistake. Well, do you want to respond to that? Yes, please. <laughs> you threw a, a gauntlet in front of you. <laughs> no, yes, um, we all have problems around the world, so <laughs> that's my answer. Um, the about money, uh, I no, what I would like to find out is that I mean you also have problems in the U.S. now, so. Um, Actually, each one has got its own problem. Right, but our telecom companies have their business model. Not just to regulate them. No, okay, okay, okay. But, I mean, our, our, our regulators are not as enlightened and forward looking as yours, probably. <laughs> but, no, again, about money, uh, what I would like to say is that a lot of that happens around the Internet is about money. And we telecom operators, from an EU, an EU perspective, we are really under political pressure to which we call them the digital agenda targets, you can call them whatever, like network deployment targets. Uh, those targets cost a lot of money, and we are facing decreasing revenues, margins are going down. Um, somehow I was also would like to refer to the point that she raised, um, I, I don't really remember any of the point you raised about changing your business model because the industry changes. A lot of what we do as telecom companies is about deploying networks that are necessary for the internet to work. So it's about digging, it's about bringing fiber, it's about putting BTS, acquiring spectrum. So then we can discuss whether this can be something that the state should do or private companies should do. But I don't see a lot about changing business model when it comes to deploying networks. That's the first point. And if you need money to do that, you need to get money somewhere. So we need to find a way to, to find a way out to this situation. 
and then and then there are some sort of we were accused recently in Brussels, but that's totally unacceptable that we're not investing in networks because we give dividends to shareholders. Now that's really something a private company cannot accept. So maybe regulation should help us uh, have a better regulatory environment to develop networks, but you cannot accuse a company of doing, giving dividends to shareholders. That's, <laughs> some, that's, I would like to make this point clear. Okay, someone has to pay for the shovels. That's why Teresa has been waiting. Can I? I have actually very little to say about money except that it seems to have an unfortunate tendency to always flow in the wrong direction and have actually found it to be one of the intractable problems of, of all of this and now I'll pass it on. Okay. So we've gotten into a bit of a um, sort of thing. I want to pull it back a little bit. The reality is business models are changing, and I can't think of a single business model that has remained the same over time ever. Um, you had the automobiles, you have everything, washing machines, everything has changed business models. If you look at the printing industry, you used to go to an office to print, now most people have a printer in their home. So unless somebody can think of a business model that has ever remained stagnant, um, I think the reality is business models change. The other thing is, is that user demands change and the consumer demands change. So in 1975, it cost about $5 million to have a computer system that had the equal performance to an iPhone 4 today, which is about $400. So if you think about that, you've got a situation where you have users running with whichever device it is that have the equal computing power that a different mechanism had in 1975 that was only accessible to a few people. And so the reality is the world is changing. We have disruptive technologies that are impacting everybody globally. And with that, we need to start looking at the realities of how we're looking at dealing with policy issues over time. And we can't retain the same arcane rules, and we can't retain the same arcane business models, with all due respect to any business model, whether it's the automobile or the banking. And that's just the unfortunate reality, but it's also the reality of opportunity for global economic growth and investment and in reaching societal needs and, and new opportunities, in particular for regions of the world that have not had a lot of the opportunities that have um, been of existence in parts of the world that have um, had it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think, you know, we need to get out of some of the weeds on some of this. This is not about U.S. or the EU or anything like that. The reality is the world is changing and we can either be a participant in that and deal with solving solutions around it or we can just sit around and not do that. So that's... As often happens, Teresa has provided a perfect summary of uh, where we are now and, a, and as a nice moment on which to end. It's 12.30. So I want to thank the panelists for their participation in this uh, discussion and thank the audience for your uh, participation as well. Have a good lunch. Thank you.